This is Cherryburn, birthplace of Thomas Buick, England's greatest engraver and Northumberland's greatest artist. Thomas Buick was born here on the 11th or 12th of August, 1753. No one in Buick's family seems to have written down the actual day of his birth. As an old man writing his memoir, he admitted he really never knew when his actual birthday was. He was baptised a week later in the parish church in Ovingham. Buick tells us in his memoir, which gives a vivid account of his childhood, that he was brought up in this house by his aunt and by his grandmother, as well as mother and father. Thomas was the oldest of eight children, uh, so Jerryburn was home to a, a large family. It's a small farm of around eight acres in the Tyne Valley near Newcastle in the northeast of England. Thomas Buick learned to love nature here. He encountered birds, animals on his doorstep. And in his memoir, he's very keen to tell us of his escapes into the countryside, literally at times jumping out of his bedroom window on the top of the house. Buick was a rascal of a child. He tells us in his memoir that he behaved outrageously badly at times, being the bane of the life of the local schoolmaster. He seems to have been mistreated by the schoolmaster and played truant on many occasions. Buick tells us in his memoir that his life is turned around by going to school in Ovingham with um, the local vicar, the Reverend Christopher Gregson. Gregson seems to have spoken to Buick in a, in a way that Buick understood and Buick was forever grateful that Gregson uh, introduced him to reading uh, and to drawing as well. And drawing seems to have been an obsessive pursuit for the young man. Initially, he's drawing birds and animals for entertainment in chalk on the flagstones in and around the cottage. His family are impressed, they buy him ink and paper and Buick draws obsessively thereafter. The family realise that he's got significant talent and they decide that he should be apprenticed to a business in Newcastle. Through family connections, they, they approach the Bealby family. Buick's grandmother has put aside money to set up Thomas as an apprentice. Buick gets to choose between the two Bealby brothers who come out to Cherryburn one day to introduce themselves. Thomas prefers the younger of the brothers, Rafe Bealby, and as a result, he becomes apprentice to Rafe in Newcastle, a trade engraver where the world of printing, uh, illustration and publishing awaits him. His abilities are quickly noticed by his masters and he becomes a specialist in wood engraving. Buick begins initially producing illustrations engraved on wood for simple mathematical textbooks, but soon goes on to engrave illustrations which will grace the publications of children's books and illustrated texts from the Newcastle publishing houses. This is a wood engraver's workbench. Um, I suspect it would be very similar in the days of Thomas Buick. If Buick was to miraculously come to life and uh, sit down at this table, he'd recognize pretty much everything. So we have here two pieces of boxwood. This is the traditional wood used for wood engraving. Um, boxwood grows very slowly. And uh, these two logs here, this one, is probably in the region of 100 years old, this one perhaps 50. Um, the girth of the wood is important for wood engraving because engravers use the end grain of the wood. So the wood is sliced up this way and then processed into blocks. Uh, it's very finely grained. If you look at the grain structure here, the annual rings are very close together and uh, the structure is very even. And these are some small prepared blocks, polished, polished boxwood. You can see the annual rings there. This is a selection of wood engraving tools. Some of them are old and some of them are new. 
and they don't differ very much at all. This one is a 19th century French tool and this is a tool that was made a few years ago. Apart from the length, they're almost identical. This one no doubt has been sharpened many times which explains why it's shorter. This is a round of boxwood which has already been darkened. Engravers always darken the surface of the wood uh, so that they can see the, the lines that they cut. This is called an engraver sandbag and it's used to rotate the block. The tools have different shapes and, and the four main shapes produce different kinds of marks. Some of them are specifically used for engraving curved lines. So the block moves continuously to produce the curve. It isn't the hand with the tool that's making the curve. Other tools produce different kinds of marks. This one, which has a diamond cross section, will give you a line that goes from fine to broad. And you get that kind of mark. Other tools are used for making broader lines. This one has a, a rounded end. It can also be used for doing stippling of dots. So you can hear the pecking action. In the 19th century, wood engravers, when wood engraving was a trade, the, the collective name for a wood engraver was a woodpecker um, because of the sound that the, the tool made they were doing a sequence of, of stippling. And finally, we have a tool called a chisel. And this would be used in a situation like this where all of the background is being cleared away around the image. And uh, it's important that the, the edges are cleared well below the surface. So that's because when the block is rolled up with ink, it's very easy for the ink to catch on areas that haven't been lowered sufficiently. The painting behind me is, of course, of Thomas Buick. It's a variation or a copy of the original portrait by James Ramsey. The portrait was rated highly by the Buick family. They said it was the very best likeness and the copy gets something of that. The portrait by Ramsey also features in the Thomas Buick in Newcastle leaflet because it was also engraved to a very high standard as well. So I'm going to show you the sequence now of a wood engraving from the preliminary drawing through to the finished print. Um, engravers always do uh, pre preliminary drawings which are then transferred onto the block before they're, they're engraved. This is because you have to plan in advance. You can't work spontaneously on the block. Uh, make mistakes can't be undone. So from that drawing, I then traced on tracing paper the outlines. And on the back, there's carbon paper, which produces the line on the block. Uh, this was stuck down onto the, onto the wood block and then trace through with a hard pencil which would produce a black line on a toned surface. A lot of engravers in order to see the progress more clearly will put talcum powder on the block which immediately brings the cuts to life. Rolling the ink out very thinly so that the roller just produces a soft hissing sound and the texture of the ink on the plate is like a fine velvet. And then transfer it in two passes to the block. Place it in the center of the bed of the press Since I'm using a, a fine handmade paper, I'm 
exploring the tympan, which is a protective layer between the block and the paper and the, the, the plate. wood engraving which was Buick's speciality and it's wood engraving that he uses to illustrate his self-published books. So in 1790 Thomas Buick publishes a general history of quadrupeds. He tells us in the memoir that the general history of quadrupeds is the beginning of his mature work and the work that he wants to be remembered for and in his memoir he tells us that he begins working on um, the first of the illustrations for the quadrupeds on the day that his father died. So it's Buick beginning his adult mature work, certainly. The text of the quadrupeds was written by Buick's partner, Ralph Bealby, and the format was to become the classic Buick layout for his natural history books. A headpiece illustration, a piece of text, and then a space-filling vignette or tailpiece illustration at the bottom of the page after the text. To modern readers of the book, the uh, book seems to have a slightly idiosyncratic arrangement. Large animals and animals important in Buick's time on the farm, like cattle and sheep, come at the beginning and the dogs appear three quarters of the way through. So here we have an original Thomas Buick block. This one is the large rough water dog from the Quadrupeds volume. One of the features of a Buick engraving is that he contoured his blocks before he engraved them. So areas of the block are lower than others. Um, you often find that there's steps. So this background area is lower than the, than the dog. Um, areas in the body are hollowed out first and then engraved. And this gives different levels of inking and different levels of pressure when they're printed so that you get very pale silvery tones in the background which would be impossible otherwise. What this means is that the blocks are quite um, quite difficult to ink. So the first layer of ink that I'm going to use is very thin indeed using a soft roller which will enable me to push the ink into the lowered sections of the block which wouldn't be possible using a a regular firm roller but I want the surface of the block which hasn't been lowered to print slightly darker so I'm using a heavier coating of ink still still quite fine with a harder roller and just simply passing this over the top so the top layer which you want to print darker has a um, stronger coating of ink and the background and lowered areas have very little ink on them. This is a, um, called an Albion Press. These were made by various makers in the country. Uh, unfortunately, Buick didn't live to see the, the use of the Albion Press. These were much more efficient than the wooden presses that his printers would have used. And I'm going to print on damp paper, as they would have been in Buick's day. placing the paper on top of the block. In addition to the, uh, the, the packing in the tin pan, I'm also using a rubber sheet. This means that the pressure will, um, will push the paper down into the lowered sections of the block by, um, by means of this soft rubber layer. Not too much pressure. Hold it for a second, it's known as a printer's kiss. These background areas, the boat, the birds, the landscape is printed in much paler tone than the rest. 
And these contours in the block are one of the things that makes Buick's prints so special. And here is another print from an original Buick wood block. This one is from the History of British Birds and shows the red fallow rope. Buick begins work on his History of British Birds in 1791. The preparation of the book takes place over the, the following six years and the first edition doesn't come out till 1797. And that's volume one, The Land Birds. The second volume features The Water Birds and it comes out in 1804. Readers of the, the history of British birds were keen not only on the headpiece illustrations but on the tailpieces as well. And it was the tailpieces which uh, people found most attractive, most characteristic of Thomas Buick. Many of the, the tailpieces show sort of um, folk customs or local habits or uh, bits of country lore. And some of the tailpieces are atmospheric and almost romantic in the storm-tossed seas and the icebergs and the maroon ships which sometimes appear, particularly amongst the descriptions of the gulls. And we know that readers love these and one of the classic descriptions of a reader engaging with Thomas Buick's History of British Birds comes of course in the opening chapter of Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte where uh, Jane sits with Buick on her knee, and it's for that short time, happy, before uh, the rest of the story unfolds. The 1862 version of the memoir uh, comes with extra illustrations provided by the family from their own archive. And according to Jane Buick, this tailpiece illustration, which appears at the end of the memoir, was Thomas Buick's last vignette the last illustration um, that he does before he himself dies. It's a cottage pretty much like Cherryburn. There's a funeral party has left the cottage carrying a coffin and at the, um, at the front, the ferryman across the Tyne awaits the arrival of the funeral party to take them over to Ovingham where the coffin will be laid to rest. Thomas Buick died on the 8th of November 1828 and he's buried beside his wife in Ovingham churchyard across the river from Cherryburn.